Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Packer, and welcome to Threshold of Hope, our program where we bring you the writings of Blessed John Paul the Great. And before we get to that, I want to mention that today is the memorial of Saints Joachim and Anne. According to a very ancient book, the Proto-Gospel of St. James, or the Proto-Evangelion of St. James, Anne and Joachim were the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And you can get this online. You can look up this Gospel of James, the Proto-Gospel of James, or Proto-Evangelion of James, as it's also called. And uh, this is a second century document uh, that gives us a lot of background on the life of Mary and the family. So, uh, uh, and that's where we get their names from and the story of the birth of Our Lady, that they were an aged couple who had no children, but when an angel appeared to St. Anne, he let her know that she would uh, have a child. And she, she did and was the Blessed Mother. So we, this is a great day to pray for your grandparents and great-grandparents, or if you uh, are grandparents, to pray for your grandchildren. Uh, it's a great role to have. Plus, it's easier than being a parent. <laughs> when they start leaking, you can give them back. <laughs> so that's one of the great things about being a grandparent. So uh, today's the Feast of Saints, Anne and Joachim. Now, we also want to take a look at some emails that you have sent us. Uh, remember, you can send them to threshold at EWTN.com. Threshold at EWTN.com. First question, dear Father Mitch, why do Catholics baptize babies while some Protestant religions wait until the age of reason or even to adulthood? Thank you, Tanya. Well, we baptize babies because this was the way that the uh, church baptized people going back to the very beginning. In the earliest years, the apostles would baptize children. We have the famous text where Jesus says, Suffer not the children to come unto me. And so they, they would baptize, they used that as a reason to baptize children and infants. As an ex example of that, St. Justin Martyr mentions that there were still, in the year 140 A.D., there were still some women in their 70s and 80s who had been baptized by the apostles. Now, the apostles were dying off by the 60s and by 70, and that they had been baptized in the Holy Land. So the apostles were gone by the late 60s. This means that when they were baptized, they had to be infants because they were too, they would have been too young otherwise. Uh, the only way that they could be baptized by apostles is if they were infants. Also, we see in 180 that Origen was baptized as a newborn infant at a synod at Carthage around 251 or 252 AD. The, one of the bishops said, let's baptize children on the eighth day, the way Jews circumcise on the eighth day. That was rejected by all the bishops there, including himself. He voted against it. The reason being, we never wait so long as the eighth day. We always baptize on the day of birth or the day after. So that the baptism of infants was something that was known in the Holy Land, in Egypt, in Western North Africa and elsewhere. It wasn't until the fourth century AD that we see Christian parents postponing the baptism of their children. The earliest recorded example of that is St. Gregory Nazianzen, who was born in 327. Prior to 327, we have no evidence that Christian families postponed the baptism of their children. They always baptized at birth. And after about 200 years of delaying baptism, they went back to infant baptism, the earlier practice. So that became the, the standard practice and still is in the church to this day. Then another one, dear Father Mitch Packwell, how do I discuss Catholicism with someone who is raised Mormon? This young lady is 23 years old and is unsure if Mormonism is the truth. However, she's hesitant to abandon the faith of her youth. She appears to have an open mind but I'm not very familiar with Mormonism or how to engage in a meaningful discussion. 
Lisa in Leesburg, Virginia. Well, Lisa, let me tell you this. First of all, you need to study Mormonism. You can ask your friend if she has an extra copy of the Book of Mormon. And you might want to read that, you know, so you know what it says. And take notes as you read it. You know, notice, take note of things um, that would, uh, you know, I, in my Book of Mormon, I took notes on the back pages and the front frontispiece, where there were some blank pages, and I took uh, everything I found that I thought was a little bit odd, I, I noted down. So I would have it for reference for later use. Secondly, I um, have read a number of books, and I would recommend one book in particular. It's called The Changing World of Mormonism. The Changing wor World of Mormonism. It's by Sandra Tanner and Gerald Tanner. So Gerald and Sandra Tanner. Tanner. Uh, you can get that. It should be easily available on on the internet. They have a bookstore in Salt Lake City where you can get, it's called Lighthouse Bookstore, and you can look them up on the internet or just look up the book, uh, The Changing World of Mormonism on the internet and read that through so that you have a better understanding of Mormonism yourself. Secondly, one of the things that appeals to Mormons is a sense of the true church. They they're taught that they are the true church and that they, they're taught that the Catholic church was founded by a demon, by Satan, and that the Protestant churches are founded by other demons and that the real church died out around the year 100 and that the Mormon church is the Latter-day Saints because they were reconstituted in 1827, I think it was, when, when he started it again, started his church. And they believe that that's the re-beginning of the true church. Now, what you want to emphasize is that we want the true church. We want it as Catholics, and Mormons want it. But how are we going to de define it? And one of the things to remind them of is that Jesus, our Lord, taught very clearly in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. It's founded on the rock of Peter, and the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. What Joseph Smith teaches is that the gates of hell did prevail against the church, and the church ceased to exist for 1,700 and some years. So what you want to do is say to her, how is it that Joseph Smith is true and the words of Jesus Christ are not true? Jesus was a false teacher, but Joseph Smith is true. That's where the real question comes in. And ask her to think about that and study with you. Study the New Testament and study uh, the history of the church. And you can read with her the fathers of the church and see the consistent teaching of the church over the centuries. And that's what I would do. Okay? All right. All right. We are now working in a document known as Redem Taurus Missio, which means Mission of the Redeemer. You can download a free electronic copy of Redem Taurus Missio at our website ewtn.com. Just go to the television tab at the website, then click where it says EWTN Live Shows, then click on Threshold of Hope, and you can watch last week's show if you missed it, and you can download this document that we're going through right there on that page. Or if you prefer, you can visit EWTN's document library and look up under Papal Encyclicals, Radom Taurus Missio. We are on paragraph 48. This is entitled Forming Local Churches. This is one of the tasks of mission, to form a local church. So it begins, conversion and baptism give entry into a church already in existence. So when you're baptized, you are not baptized into a brand new church. It's the church that already has existed since Christ, 
since the apostles and, since, and through the centuries. So it's not a new church. And that's one of the things that relates to that last email, in fact. And when we're baptized in a church that, that, that's already in existence, conversion um, uh, also requires the establishment of new communities which confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's going to be one of the things that the new communities have to do. We don't want the new communities to start confessing a different faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin and as the Lord of our lives. That's the task. This is part of God's plan, for it pleases Him to, uh, as as it says in uh, uh, Lumen Gentium, paragraph 9, at all times and in every race, God has welcome, give, given welcome to whosoever fears him and does what is right. God, however, does not make men holy and save them merely as individuals. We are not saved as individuals without bond or link between one another. Rather, has it pleased him to bring men together as one people, a people which acknowledges him in truth and serves him in holiness. Now this is a people of faith, not a people of ethnic group, race, country, political party, or any other such thing. We are a people of faith. And that that people of faith includes people of every nationality and every race, every political party, and every country. Nobody is excluded from being part of that people. But you are not called as an individual. You are called to belong to a people of faith. The mission to the Gentiles, to the, to the nations, has this objective, to found Christian communities and develop churches to their full maturity. So that's going to be the twofold purpose. The missionaries want to start brand new communities. That's what you do as a missionary. And secondly, bring those communities to Christian maturity. The goal of our faith is not to remain spiritual infants. The goal is to become mature Christians. And that's our task. And mature communities, not just mature individuals. This is a central and determining goal of missionary activity. So much so that the mission is not completed until it succeeds in building a new particular church which functions normally in its local setting. Now, what does it mean by particular church? A particular church means a diocese with its own bishop. That's the goal, to begin a Christian community, to let it grow big enough so that there are lots of priests, religious and lay people, and a bishop over that community. That's what we want to see happen. That's when a church is mature. And that's what we want to see happen. The decree Ad Gentes deals with this subject at length. For instance, in Ad Gentes, paragraph 19, it says, and I quote, the work of planting the church in a given human community reaches a certain goal when the congregation of the faithful, already rooted in social life, and somewhat conformed to the local culture, enjoys a certain firmness and stability. So you want the church to be firm and stable. That is to say, it is already equipped with its own supply, perhaps insufficient, of local priests. So they need to have local priests, local religious, and laymen. And is endowed with these institutions and ministries, which are necessary for leading and expanding the life of the people of God under the guidance of their own bishop. Now, usually a community that is a missionary community has as its early bishops 
the missionaries. The missionaries come there and they're the first bishops. But one of the goals is for there to be local bishops. Bishops from that people. And we've seen this go on all over the world. So that United States had foreign bishops in its first years. But now our bishops come from the United States. In Africa, they had foreign bishops. Now they are Africans. And in Latin America and Australia and all these other places that were once missionaries with foreign missionaries as bishops, now the local people are the bishops. And that's the way it should be. And since the council, a line of theological reflection has developed which emphasizes that the whole mystery of the church is contained in each particular church. So that the, the whole of the church is contained in each diocese. That's what he means. Remember that. When he talks about a particular church, he means the local diocese. And that this is very much what uh, contains the whole church, provided that that local church does not isolate itself, but stays in communion with the universal church. So that for, for the local church to be a microcosm of the whole church, it must be in union with the whole church. Just like you can say, my finger below is me. This is my finger. So long as it's still attached to my hand. If it's not attached to my hand, it's no longer my finger. It's a piece of rotting meat. God forbid. But that's the same thing way with the local churches. That the local church has to stay united with the universal church. And in turn, become missionary itself. So that the, the, the church that once was a mission becomes missionary. And that's happened and is happening. The United States was a mission church. And some parts of our country still are mission territory. But we've sent many missions to other countries. And Africa was once a mission continent. But now the Africans are sending missionaries all over the world. India was once a mission place and still is in many ways. But it is already also sending missionaries to other places, including the United States and Europe. Here we are speaking of a great and lengthy process, doesn't happen overnight, in which it is hard to identify the precise stage at which a missionary activity, properly so-called, comes to an end and is replaced by pastoral activity. When do you say that it's no longer a mission? Well, again, in the United States, we still have missionary territory. There's still big parts of the United States that are missionary. I've had a number of guests on EW10 Live especially from the Catholic Extension Society, who help the missions in the United States, where Catholics are very few and priests and nuns are very few. So it's hard to tell when you're no longer missionary and when you're doing pastoral activity, but it's a spectrum. It's a gradual change, and we should just expect it to be a gradual change. Even so, certain points must remain clear. It is necessary first and foremost to strive to establish Christian communities everywhere. Now, in Ad Gentes, the Vatican II document on mission, paragraph 15, it says, Therefore, let the missionaries, who are God's co-workers, raise up congregations of the faithful such that, walking worthy of the vocation to which they have been called, they may exercise the prophetic priestly and royal office which God has entrusted to them. In this way, the Christian community will be a sign of God's presence in the world. For by reason of the Eucharistic sacrifice, this community is ceaselessly on the way with Christ to the Father. Carefully nourished on the word of God, it bears witness to Jesus Christ. And finally, it walks in charity and is fervent with the apostolic spirit. So 
That's the, so the, these communities are a sign of the presence of God in the world, according to Ad Gentes, paragraph 19, and which grow until they become churches. They continue to grow. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, when we had the ordination of one of the men in my province back in June, the bishop who did it was an archbishop from India. He came from Patna, which was a mission of my province of Jeshua. So American missionaries went to Patna, India, when there were just a few thousand Christians there. I think something like 5,000. Now, that has become an archdiocese and four other dioceses. It's grown so much because the church is so much alive in that place. They've grown and become churches. And that's what we see there. Notwithstanding the high number of dioceses, there are, there are thousands of dioceses. In the United States alone, we have 250 dioceses or so. And there are hundreds and hundreds of dioceses around the world. But despite that number, there are still very large areas where no local churches exist. No matter how many dioceses we still have, there are big places in the world where there are no bishops and no dioceses, or where the number is insufficient in relation to the vastness of the territory and the density of the population. So there are many places where there are a lot of people and big territories and no diocese and very few parishes. So this is a, a, a situation in the world. And we must be alert to the fact that many parts of the world are not yet part of a diocese. They don't yet belong. They don't have their own particular church. There is still much to be done in implanting and developing the church. There are places of Asia Parts of Africa, though less and less parts of Africa. Some parts of Latin America, where there needs to be a church planted in, because there are no churches there. There are no missionaries. And this is something that needs to be done to develop the church. This phase of ecclesial history, called the Plantatio Ecclesiae, the planting, plantation of the church. That's what that literally means. The planting of the church has not reached its end. We still have much more to do. There is a great deal of work yet available for the church. And there's much to do in planting the church in many parts of the world. Our work is not nearly done. Indeed, for much of the human race, it has yet to begin. So there still is need for a beginning of the church in uh, uh, Kazakhstan and many other these new countries. There's a lot of work to do. Responsibility for this task belongs to the universal church. The whole church throughout the world has a responsibility to help plant these new churches. And there's also responsibility for the particular churches. Different dioceses have a responsibility to help plant churches in neighboring territories and get the church started and spread. It's an issue for the whole people of God. Each one of us has this as a responsibility. If, no, if nothing else, at the very least, we must pray for the missions and try to support the missions. And it's also, it's a responsibility of all of the church's missionary forces. The missionary orders, the lay people, and priests, brothers, sisters, who are all involved in the missions, all of them uh, have a responsibility for spreading the church. Every church, even one made up of recent converts, is missionary by its nature. And don't we see that in Acts of the Apostles? St. Paul started the churches in Asia Minor. 
but from one of those churches. He brought Timothy. Timothy was one of the new converts. But he began to go on the missionary journeys with St. Paul and was himself made a bishop of the city of Ephesus. So even new converts are called to be in the mission. It's not only for the old-time converts, the new ones too. And the church is both evangelized and evangelizing. Now that's an important thing to keep in mind too. We must still be evangelized. How many Catholics do you know who don't understand the catechism yet? How many Catholics do you come across in your own everyday life who might not even know the Ten Commandments, yet alone live them? Who don't know the Gospels, yet alone live them? How many times do we know people who don't know what you're talking about when you say that Jesus saves us from our sins? They have a vague idea. They might know that he died. I'll never forget that this one comedian went on the street one Easter and he was asking people, what's Easter about? One lady said, oh, that's when Jesus got born. <laughs> she didn't even know what Easter was about. She had no idea. So we must still evangelize the people around us as well as become evangelizers ourselves. And sometimes we don't understand a lot. I'm still learning a lot about the faith. My whole life long, I keep learning more and more. There's no stopping, no matter how old we get. We never know everything. We never know everything. And if we think that we know too much, we've got a problem. If we think we're too smart to learn anything new, we've got a problem. We still need to be evangelized. And we need to evangelize others. Just like that lady in the uh, email was doing with her Mormon friend. Faith must always be presented as a gift of God. It's a gift from God to be lived out in community. So we live our faith in our families, in our parishes, our associations, our dioceses and to be extended to others through the witness and word and deed. The evangelizing activity of the Christian community, first in its own locality and then elsewhere as part of the church's universal mission, is the clearest sign of a mature faith. You know your faith is becoming mature when you begin to evangelize. If you're not evangelizing, there might still be some immaturity in your faith. This is a way to recognize the maturity of your faith. A radical conversion in thinking is required in order to become a missionary. And this holds true for individuals and entire communities. We have to rethink how I approach people. Do I understand? Some of them might be bound for hell. Do I want them to go to hell? I hope not. We don't want anybody to go to hell. We want everybody to go to heaven. And so we have to radically change the way we think about people so that we think, how can I help them get to heaven? As well as get there myself. Don't forget that. <laughs> the Lord is always calling us to come out of ourselves and to share with others the goods we possess. Starting with the most precious gift of all. What's the most precious gift we have to share? Our faith. Because by it, we get to go to heaven and we avoid hell. Is there anything more important to give your children? I have heard from so many silly people. I don't want to teach my children the faith. They'll make a decision about it when they're 18. Well, they don't make that decision about whether they're citizens of the United States. You don't make that this kind of delayed decision about speaking English. You teach them English from the beginning. And so you should teach them the faith because that is even more precious. Speaking English won't get you to heaven. Faith in Jesus Christ does. And this is something that we must keep in mind. 
the effectiveness of the church's organizations, movements, parishes, and apostolic works must be measured in the light of this missionary imperative. These parishes and associations are powerful to the extent that they go out on mission and that they share the faith with others. Only by becoming missionary will the Christian community be able to overcome its internal divisions and tensions and rediscover its unity and its strength of faith. All the arguing that people do amongst themselves, that will fade away as we start to focus on going outside of ourselves. Instead of turning in and looking at ourselves, we need to go outside of ourselves and preach the gospel of Jesus and talk about Jesus and make him the center and then bring other people to him. All right, we need to take a break. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes with questions from our studio audience and then continue on with this document. So please stay with us. Nice audience here today. It's a really good sized group. A lot of folks, uh, a lot of you were here for the uh, family get together this past weekend. And it's good to see you stayed on and enjoyed our, our, our beautiful area around here in Birmingham. And I hope that you're enjoying your stay. Uh, uh, did you get any fried green tomatoes yet? No? Oh, you got to try to do that before. Yeah, yeah, you got to get those. Uh, hamburger heaven and all that good stuff. If you would like to be here on pilgrimage, please contact our pilgrimage department and they will help you with scheduling uh, you know, the masses, the programs you can be at. They're, they're all free, by the way. And uh, we'd love to have you come and join us. So call the pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271. 271-2966, or just go to the website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you all sorts of information. Also, before we go to our student questions, we want to let you know that the convocation for the Confraternity of Catholic Clergy begins today and runs through Friday in Chicago, actually in Mundelein, at the Cardinal Stritch Retreat House. Mundelein is a suburb of Chicago. And if you know any priests, deacons, or seminarians, encourage them to check out the Confraternity of Catholic Clergy. You can get more information by going to www.catholicclergy.net, and they'll give you more information about it. Okay? All right, let's start off with a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Milford, Michigan. Good to have you here. And Thank what is you. your question? Um, I'd like to know how do you evangelize the parents of children I have children that live all around me. Um, the parents are Catholic, and they haven't baptized the children. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to the parents, it's like, okay, we're going to wait till they get older, and we want them to decide. Yeah. Um, and I have a hard time because I talk to them the same as you just said about speaking English. Um, or are you not even going to educate your kids? Just let them decide what school they want to go to when they grow up. And they, they think I'm, like, you know, crazy. So. But see, here's... Here's what, you know, you have to find out is that they're probably afraid of imposing something on their kids. All right. That's one of the things. They're probably afraid of imposing some spiritual obligations on their children. And what you want to do is ask them, what is your concern? Why do you want to wait until they grow older? And at what age, if your child starts to show an interest in the faith, would you bring him or her to church every week? And what about yourself? Why are you not going to church on Sunday? You don't leave the children at home and not go to church, do you, do, or, or do you go to church and leave them at home? What about your own faith life? And that might be the, the issue. 
You might want to ask them, when was the last time they got to Mass on Sunday? When was the last time they went to confession? And that might be the big issue, that they don't want to go to confession themselves so they don't teach their children. Now, if the children are around you and you get a chance to talk to them and share them videos and games and things like that, you know, you can teach them the faith. Uh, that can be very good. Um, but they should learn the faith just like they learn civics. They learn to be a citizen from an early age. They don't wait until they're 18 before they give them the rights of being an American. What about the rights of being a citizen of heaven? That's why we want them baptized. You gain a citizenship in heaven with baptism. Do you not want your children to go to heaven or do you want them to go to hell? That's another good way to put the question. You know, well, I don't want to fit them to feel guilty about this. I don't Ask the question. Okay, you're welcome. Sir, where are you from? Uh, hi, Father. I'm Jim Gaffney. I'm from St. John's, Michigan. And what's your question? Well, I was wondering, how do you evan evangelize someone who has fallen away from the faith or does not go to church at all or very little? Sure. One of the things that you need to do in those circumstances is ask, you have to engage the person in a conversation and become friends with them. Oftentimes it's very necessary to become friends and just deal with them socially. Because if you jump right into the question, you're asking about something that's very intimate. You know, your faith life is the most intimate part of your life. And so just to jump in and say, why don't you go to church on Sundays might not be the best way to start. But it's you look for an opening. For instance, you say grace before you eat your lunch. If they're a co-worker and let, let make, make the sign of the cross and don't be ashamed of doing that. You know, that becomes a way to open up a conversation and other conversations might start up. I was just talking to a young man who is traveling through Europe and uh, people just asked him what he did for a living. And he said, well, I teach religion at a Catholic high school. That became the basis for, for these atheists to ask him questions about why he was a believer and why he's a philosopher. And he talked to these strangers, complete strangers, about his faith. And they were listening. But they started the conversation. And that's a good way to do it. Do something to intrigue them about yourself and then get into the conversation and be ready with the answers. Know your faith as well as you can. Study the faith, read about it, read the catechism, know what to answer when people ask you questions. And if they do ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, don't make it up. <laughs> Say, I don't know, but I'm gonna go look it up. And go look it up in the catechism or some other place. Those would be some ways to start. All right. Thank you, Father. Sure. All right. We are still in paragraph 49.3. And we're discussing the formation of churches. Missionary personnel coming from other churches and countries must work in communion with their local counterparts for the development of the Christian community. You don't come in from another country like gangbusters and think that you know everything about how to do it and the locals know nothing. That's insulting. You have to show respect for the wisdom and the knowledge that the locals have for their own culture, their own language, their own circumstances, and what works. So that's a very important point. In particular, it falls to missionary personnel in accordance with the directors of the bishops and in cooperation with those who are responsible at the local level to foster the spread of the faith in the expansion of the church in non-Christian environments and among non-Christian groups. So that the missionaries are especially to work with the non-Christians in the area. You know, if there already are Christians, the missionaries are not needed for them. They already have their own development, but go to the places where the non-Christians are. 
So, for instance, I was in Borneo back in 1994, and the missionaries were not going to just the city where there were a lot of Christians, but they were going to the villages out in the jungle. And they were meeting people who had been headhunters. I went to one village and they still had human heads hanging from the ceiling. You know, this, this is a, uh, an interesting group. Now, they were very pleasant to me, but I got a little nervous when they said, you're a nice looking fellow. <laughs> I didn't want to be a foreign souvenir. But these missionaries went off to these villages and they would preach to them. And already 450 villages had become Catholic. And 250 other villages were asking for missionaries. They wanted Christ because they were totally locked up in a religion that was filled with demon worship. They had to placate demons all the time. And they were tired of it. That's why they held, had the heads in the house. The heads were held as hostage. You can't send an evil spirit to burn down the house. I got your head. <laughs> that was the mentality. You know, <clears throat> and it was really neat to see how, you know, in the Christian villages I went to, they would have the stations of the cross set up in the, in the longhouse instead of human heads. Big improvement. <laughs> so you want to go to the non-Christian environments and non-Christian groups and encourage a missionary sense within the particular churches. And that's what's also going on. The people from one village were going to the other villages and becoming catechists. The bishop had a school to train catechists. I got EWTN's permission to give them a... Uh, basic copy of the Holy Land Rosary, you know, a, 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 a master copy, we call it. I gave them a master copy, and they started duplicating it and selling it in order to support the school so that they, they would have more missionaries going off from these villages to new villages, speaking their Iban language. And that the pastoral concern would always be concerned with a concern for the, combined with a concern for the mission uh, to the Gentiles. So that as you move, remember that we talk about stages. There's the stage in which you're on mission, the stage in which you are a pastoral church that's established and you're dealing with pastoral care. And then in places where the faith has been lost, you're then dealing with re-evangelization or new evangelization. So, you have pastoral concern, but you also raise up concern for new missionaries to come from your community. And that was exactly what, what I saw going on. Iban tribesmen were going off to other Iban tribesmen and, and evangelizing them. It was really cool to meet one of the Catholics. And I, I, did, I saw that he had... Uh, a beautiful picture of Jesus and one of the Blessed Mother in his house. And I asked him, since he was newly baptized, did you have any heads in your house? I said, oh yeah, I used to bring back one or two gunny sacks full at a time. You know, this, <laughs> this, is, a, this is a tough community. <laughs> but like I say, now he has a picture of Jesus and of Mary instead of a, somebody else's head in his house. So it made a big difference. In this way, the church will make its own, the solicitude of Christ, the good shepherd, who fully devotes himself to his flock, but at the same time is mindful of the other sheep that are not of this fold. So that there's, this is from John chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice. So there shall be one flock, one shepherd. This is what Jesus wants. These other people who don't know Jesus, he wants them to stop being headhunters. And they were, they were cannibals too. Now one of the things about them is that the Blessed Sacrament receiving the Eucharist and going to Mass 
was a very powerful thing. They had grown up eating human flesh. When they changed to eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ at the Mass, it transformed them. It gave them a whole different sense of who they are. And it was a very powerful experience for them. And the Eucharist meant a lot to these people. And we, we should have such a strong sense of the importance of the Eucharist. Now, this solicitude, this concern for mission will serve as a motivation and a stimulus for renewed commitment to ecumenism. So that's the next topic he brings in. If we are concerned about going off to the lost sheep, if we are concerned about bringing in these people to know Jesus, we should also be concerned about ecumenism. The relationship between ecumenical activity and missionary activity makes it necessary to consider two closely associated factors so that we should look upon ecumenism and missionary activity as closely related. On the one hand, we must recognize, as it says in Agentes, that again, the Vatican II document on the missions, paragraph 6, Agentes, it says, we must recognize that the division among Christians damages the most holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature and blocks the way to the faith for many. When people in the mission see that the Protestants are saying bad things about the Catholics, and the Catholics are saying bad things about the Protestants, that hurts the mission. Well, which, if Jesus is so good, how come these Christians are fighting among themselves? Right? That's a good question, too. That's not a dumb question. That's a very good question. And that we should very much pay attention to that. So the fact that the good news of reconciliation is preached by Christians who are divided among themselves, weakens their witness. We can talk about being reconciled with Christ and having the forgiveness of our sins, but if we can't get along, that's a bad witness. That's a bad witness. It is thus urgent to work for the unity of Christians so that missionary activity can be more effective. We need to work for ecumenism so that we can be more effective, and that the others can be more effective too. This was one of my experiences when I worked in Peru back in 75, that the Catholics and the Protestants had worked out a good way of working together. The Protestants were from a Bible translation society, and we were in the jungle of the Amazon. And there were people who spoke, didn't speak Spanish. They only spoke native languages. And they didn't understand Spanish. So we needed to have the Bible in their language. And the Catholics helped the Protestant translators. And the Protestant translators helped the Catholics. That was a good witness, you know, of, of cooperating to help bring these people the gospel of Jesus. At the same time, we must not forget that the efforts toward unity are themselves the work of reconciliation. If we are working toward unity with other Protestant Christians, then we are bringing about reconciliation, a reconciliation that is much needed. And this is something that, a reconciliation that God is bringing about in our midst. The Lord God wants us to do this. On the other hand, it is true that some kind of communion, though imperfect, exists among all who have received baptism in Christ. So we Catholics recognize that all baptized Christians are united to us. If you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then you share in the one baptism that St. Paul preached. St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that we recognize that the other Christians have this one baptism in Christ. On this basis, the Council established a principle, again in Ad Gentes, paragraph 15, that insofar 
as religious conditions allow, ecumenical activity should be furthered in such a way that excluding any appearance of indifference or confusion on the one hand, or of unhealthy rivalry on the other, Catholics should cooperate in a brotherly spirit with their separated brethren among, uh, uh, according to the norms of the decree on ecumenism, making before the nations a common profession of faith insofar as their faiths are common in God and in Jesus Christ and in cooperating in social and technical projects as well as in cultural and religious ones. So what he's saying is that when the other Christians though of different sects and different churches and denominations, though they share or because they share faith in baptism and in Christ, we can cooperate with them. For instance, if you have a hospital, medicine is not Baptist or Catholic. Medicine is medical, and we can treat the sick together. Hunger isn't Pentecostal or Catholic. Hunger is ecumenical, and we can all help each other feed the poor, not worrying about who gets credit except Jesus, that Jesus gets the credit for feeding his little ones. That's what we want to see happen. So, we, but we don't want to go into indifferentism. In indifferentism means that, well, whatever religion you are, it doesn't make a difference. No, the religions do make a difference. And there are differences in our faith. Some churches have sacraments, some do not. Some have ordinances and some do not. Some you know, do various things and that differently than we do. And we have to pay attention to the fact that we do disagree. But whenever it is possible to agree on feeding a hungry child or clothing a naked person, we can do that together. And that, that that will help ecumenism. Ecumenical activity and harmonious witness to Jesus Christ by Christians who belong to different churches and ecclesial communities has already borne abundant fruit. Like I mentioned, where the Bible, this Protestant Bible Society and the Catholic missionaries were working together to help come up with the best possible uh, translation of the Bible into the language of the local tribes. They were helping each other to do that translation so that the people would have a good Bible that they could trust, and then we can deal with our differences. So that's a good example of some of the abundant fruit that's been born. But it is ever more urgent that they work and bear witness together at this time because there are Christian and para-Christian sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses are not a Christian sect. They don't believe that Jesus is God the Son. They believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. And they teach people and draw them away from the real Jesus. So we have to be ready to deal with them because they sow confusion by their activity. The expansion of these sects represents a threat for Catholic Church and all the ecclesial communities with which he's engaged in dialogue, all the various Protestants with whom we are in dialogue. These sects cause confusion for everybody, and we need to, to help work together on, to stop that confusion about who Jesus is whenever possible. And in the light of local circumstances, the response of Christians can itself be an ecumenical one. So that I worked with Dr. Walter Martin, uh, who was a Baptist apologist. He and I engaged in debates about Catholicism, but we worked together to fight against the New Age movement and various sects. And so we could cooperate on that kind of thing. These are the kind of ways in which we can work together and further the kingdom of God and help bring many more people to Christ. May we all engage in this activity in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you.